from you this afternoon here. I'm Diane Herrick, a resident on the uh, program committee. And we're delighted to have Catherine Brown here with her vast experience to speak on the Shenandoah Pioneers, um, the third, second in a series that we're having. We welcome our guests who are here to hear this nice talk today as well. Um, afterwards, I'd like to invite you to wine reception out in the lobby as well, just and you can chat more with Catherine out there. Catherine's vast experience in the history of the Valley and the roles that she has played over various decades is wonderful, and uh, she's going to tell us more about it. I can see that she's prepared a handout, so I'm sure you're going to learn more about that too. Let's welcome Catherine. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. yes. All right, good. Now, it's very dangerous as a teacher to give a handout to students at the beginning of the class because they may test their skills in aeronautical engineering. And I hope you do not choose to do that. We're going to talk about your handout later. You can ignore it until then. Okay, so here we go. Um, picture, not a great one, I admit it's stinky as maps go, but I simply wanted to remind you that in greater Virginia, prior to the Civil War, we were smack dab in the middle of the state. Couldn't ask for a more important location. So we're gonna take a look at our pioneers, the ones that we're descended from, but I wanna remind you that long before we came here, the original pioneers had the place to themselves for eight or 9,000 years, and they did leave behind traces, but that's for another lecture for someone else to give. <laughs> By the late 17th century, when interest was beginning to appear in the valley, there were very few traces of those original settlers and their descendants. Uh, for the most part, because the pressures had pushed so many um, Indian tribes elsewhere than in Virginia, uh, the valley no longer had but about three villages in it at the time the first settlers came, uh, and was mainly being used as a hunting area. I want to for you to have in mind as we wander through the valley today, something that, that maybe you don't necessarily usually think about. Um, don't think so much about those sturdy, decent, honest settlers who set out on their own to explore this place. I think you need to keep in mind that the valley was settled by European types mainly because of its strategic importance in international struggle for imperial dominance among France, Spain, and Great Britain. This territory was very valuable as a sort of a pawn in that struggle, and much of what led to its settlement owes to that international fact and not just to sort of quaint local history. There was some early interest in the valley in the 17th century, but it mainly was restricted to exploring expeditions. A couple of them came out from eastern Virginia, Abraham Wood and the Bats and Fallon uh, in the 1650s and 70s. And then a very interesting explorer came out here on his own. He was a German physician uh, he was taking a tour through the valley in 1669 and 70, and he wrote his adventures up, not in German, but in Latin, <laughs> and they were published in New England and then translated into English by somebody. I don't think it was a bestseller. <laughs> it's an important part of our history. Uh, the next explorer who came along and called attention to the valley was another German speaker. He came from Bern in Switzerland, and his name was Franz Ludwig Michel. He was here in 1702 on behalf of some Swiss investors who were hoping to open mines 
all over Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and the Carolinas. Uh, the next big uh, European to be interested in the valley was Alexander Spotswood, and we'll talk a little about him in a minute. Here's the map that Michel drew of the valley. Uh, it's just a, not a serious map, but a sort of a diagram. He's standing near the Potomac. That's the Potomac down there on the bottom. And he's looking south into the valley, the Shenandoah River, and I think this is Massanutten, uh, Seven Bends there. Uh, so it has a bit of accuracy, but not a whole lot. Uh, the first, or at least the only surviving early drawing of the College of William and Mary was also done by this man in 1702. That's an aside. Okay. Today is the 307th anniversary of the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe. Now, how's that for a nice coincidence? <laughs> Most of you probably know about this expedition. Uh, Governor Spotswood got it going. And it wasn't just a fun camping trip for those guys. Uh, it had a very serious purpose. From Spotswood's perspective, he took the imperial view and he wanted to see what was on the other side of the mountain because he wanted Great Britain to be sure it had a secure hold on it. Uh, he had other interests too. He was a land grabber himself and also interested in mining. Now he had a large entourage. There were apparently some Native Americans as guides. Uh, there were a number of enslaved persons. There were were several com of a company of Virginia Rangers. Those are kind of like the militia. Um, and about a dozen gentlemen planters who had large plantations in eastern Virginia and who were eager to own even more land. So uh, there is a very, uh, let us say, somewhat greedy background to the initiation of exploration of the valley. Now the British interest in the valley is, gets funneled through the Board of Trade, which was the body that looked after the colonies. They're very interested in protecting settlements against Indian incursion, and they had reason to fear some of the Indians who were out uh, west of the mountains. They want to be a buffer to French exploration. Uh, the French have been quite aggressive lately, coming down from Canada and up from New Orleans, exploring the Mississippi and the Ohio Valley, laying claim, um, and there's great fear then that the enemies, the Catholic French, are going to get out there uh, ahead of the English. Uh, land development is always in the mind of these people. They are looking for ways to make money out of the land, from farming, from mining, from fur trapping, from whatever. Gooch is obviously, as he is the successor to Alexander Spotswood as the Lieutenant Governor, and he's very interested in getting settlers out here in the valley. So he develops a system of encouraging Europeans to settle by making very large grants to persons who can be middlemen to recruit smaller farmers. And of course, they want European Protestants. They do not want any Catholics out here. <laughs> now, in addition to the governor, there's another figure who's very important in the history of the valley, not so much in our part, but in the lower valley. And that is Lord Fairfax, the only British aristocrat to be resident in the 13 colonies. And he lived in the valley, but he had inherited the large land grant King Charles had made to his grandfather, Lord Culpepper, in the 1660s. That grant was for all of the land between the Potomac River and the Rappahannock River. Well, he had a pretty crafty land agent in Robert Carter, often called King Carter, and he argued and won the argument in courts that uh, the wording really meant the first headwaters 
of the Potomac and the Rappahannock. Now, the first headwaters of the Rappahannock are over about here in Culpeper County. But as it happens, the first headwaters of the Potomac are deep into the heart of present West Virginia. And when you draw a line between one headwater and the next, you've got something like four million acres that belong to Lord Fairfax and was his to develop. And his man to develop it was King Carter, who had, in addition to serving Lord Fairfax, his own personal interests in getting more income, in uh, doing some mining, and seeing to his heritage uh, so that his grandchildren would have land of the sort that he had. So land developers are the people who get in on the act and are the recruiters of our ancestors as pioneer settlers. In Frederick County, uh, the Van Meter brothers who were Dutch uh, came down and uh, sold some of their land and then ended up selling the rest of it to Joost Heid and Robert McKay. Um, so they ended up with 100,000 acres. And then Robert Carter uh, took a little commission for securing all that land to Lord Fairfax and thought he'd be happy with 50,000 acres, uh, which he got and divided up among his grandchildren. Um, in Augusta County, the developers were William Beverly. You're probably all familiar with him. He had the large patent of 118,000 acres in what is present Augusta County. Got that in 1836. The same year, Benjamin Burton, a Quaker from New Jersey, um, came down and got 92,000 acres. And that, of course, as I'm sure you all know, is the heart of the um, Rockbridge County settlement. And then James Patton uh, was another developer who got a lot. Now, in Virginia, when you get enough people moving into a new area, they want to have a county of their own. And so in the 1730s, when most of the settlement is happening, the General Assembly created two new counties. The one in the north or lower part of the valley is Frederick, and the one in the south is Augusta, which actually stretched all the way to the Mississippi River. <laughs> now, the land grants in the upper valley, I hope you all know we're in the upper valley, and you understand why we're in the upper valley, and why Winchester in the north is in the lower valley. Everybody got that? Little iffy on that? Okay. Valleys have to do with the rivers that run through them. And the Shenandoah River, which makes the Shenandoah Valley, <laughs> runs north and dumps into the Potomac. The upper end of the valley is the beginning. The lower end is the part <coughs> near the Potomac. The upper end is in Augusta County. The lower end is way up in West Virginia now, in Berkeley County. Okay, so what is up on the map is the lower end, and what's down on the map is the upper end. <laughs> Got that? Okay. So here is what the land grants look like in the upper valley. Uh, two different views of the same thing. Uh, this is present day Augusta County. The pink part is the uh, William Beverly patent. And then here is Rock Bridge, and the pink dotted part is Gordon's Land. <coughs> and that's the way they look today. Now, it's very hard for you to read that. These are the earlier lands settled, and the black patches are the later ones. Um, and you can see then that, that the northern part got settled a little ahead of the southern part uh, here in Rockbridge. 
Now, a terribly important uh, role that surveyors played in the early valley or any place in, in the early America. If you have a land grant, um, you need to know how to find it. And if you've got a chunk of it uh, for your farm that you just bought from the big developer, you want to be able to get to it in order to start building your cabin and clearing some land. So you get a surveyor to survey it for you. And the surveyor writes up his notes. So what you have here are actually what some of the original surveyor notes in Augusta County look like in uh, their notebooks up in the courthouse in Stanton. And you've got a, a view here of a surveyor. Uh, it's at least a two-man team because one man has got to carry the chain that is used to mark out the points. A really important surveyor in the valley, in the lower part, was none other than, yes, it's where he got his start in politics, remember? Okay, now if you've got this land, you're gonna have to get yourself down to it from Pennsylvania, because that's where nearly all of the settlers came from and you have nothing but an Indian footpath to follow. So the early settlers can only come in walking and by pack horse. Impossible to bring a covered wagon or even a cart. So that's how they did it. Now, when you think of those early settlers, let's not. <laughs> we think they look much more like this, okay? Um, but they were prepared to be out there hunting and uh, their powder horn and all of their hunting equipment is mighty important. When enough sturdy early settlers had gotten here, they start petitioning the county government for roads and the government will then appoint people to build roads. There is no VDOT to do it for you, so you have to do it for yourself. So people will be named who own land in a certain area, then they're the ones who are to come up with the labor to work on the road. And slowly but surely, that's how they begin to widen uh, their trails and get some transportation, but it's mighty basic. Ultimately, of course, they developed what came to be known as the Great Wagon Road that went through the valley. Uh, they widened it so that wagons could get through there, and they carried a vast amount of commerce um, in the 18th century. Once, once it was wide enough for a wagon, then there was a lot of traffic back and forth. Uh, these were not frontiersmen who were isolated. They really weren't. Um, in the 19th century, this got macadamized and was called the Valley Turnpike. And then in the 20th century, when the car came along, it got paved and became U.S. Route 11. And it's uh, still there, bigger and better than ever. And of course, it's been superseded by the horrible 81. <laughs> so they were then able to come in this way, um, either by a cart drawn by oxen or mules or horses or whatever, or by some of the variety of wagons. Okay, let's start looking at the people. They are a real patchwork, and not a neat patchwork, a crazy quilt kind of patchwork. And that gets us to your handout, which talks about the ethnic settlement of the valley. It is very, it's, it's not like everyone just flowed on down and they were all intermingled and you just, no. They settle in very definite groups, and they like to settle with their own kind. So you've got very, very different ethnic areas depending on which settlers acquire land in which areas. And I just find this an utterly fascinating chart. First time I saw it, it just kind of blew my mind because I had never really realized how vastly different the groups are in the areas. So starting up in the north, in Berkeley County, 
um, which is now the eastern panhandle of West Virginia. Uh, that is the most English, uh, well, second most English. It's got kind of an even thing there, um, almost exactly even between the English, the Scotch-Irish, and the Germans, and a smattering of Dutch people. And, and those really are from the Netherlands. Uh, the other use of Dutch, of course, is, is for Pennsylvania Dutch, who are not from the Netherlands. <laughs> Frederick County next has a high English population. It's very close, you know, to Northern Virginia and fairly easy for English to come over there and settle without having to do a great deal of mountain climbing. Um, a fair amount of Scotch-Irish, a quarter, uh, more German, smattering of Dutch. Shenandoah County, which is uh, the bottom part of Frederick, was settled overwhelmingly, as you can see, by the Germans. And the additional bunch are German-speaking. Um, very few English and almost minuscule amount of Scotch-Irish. So those ethnic groups are not mixing. When you get down to Rockingham County, uh, you get a little bit more even division there, but still a heavier German settlement than anything else. Augusta, uh, the English population is declining, the Scots-Irish is growing, and the German is kind of smaller. Now you get down to Rockbridge, Again, the English are declining. 73% Scotch-Irish and a puny little 8% German. So again, uh, a, a county that, that has very little mixture and, and a great deal of one viewpoint. Uh, we're going to look real quickly at some of the settlers. Uh, we'll start with those who can speak English. Um, the first ones to come in tended to be Quakers, uh, usually with an Irish background. Um, I don't know whether you can read those names very well. Adam Hollingsworth, uh, who was a very good man in that he actually paid the local Shawnee Indians for the land he got. He paid them a cow, a calf, and a bolt of red cloth. Uh, Alexander Ross uh, got 100,000 acre patent as a land developer. Uh, another Quaker, Morgan Bryan, who was also of Irish background but born in Denmark, uh, very closely related to Daniel Boone's family, so I found those interesting. The Germans uh, are the next group I'm gonna look at, and they are not English speaking, and they don't take the language up for a pretty good time. Uh, they had a lot of reasons for wanting to leave Germany. They had terrible weather, terrible harvest. They were hungry, seriously hungry in many cases. Uh, the land had been devastated by a number of years of warfare with Louis XIV and his armies just marched up and down there because it's the part that was right on his border. Uh, it's very hard to get land in Germany if you don't already have it, and so they had very limited prospects there. There had been some changes in church laws that some of them didn't like, and a huge Anabaptist dissent was developing in parts of Germany. A lot of propaganda was published to attract the Germans. Uh, here you see the title page of one uh, publication trying to get them to come to the Carolinas. They poured out of Germany in 1709 and went to London. Why didn't they go straight to America? Because you had to go in an English ship. So uh, they went to London to get on, on a uh, British ship. And there they were, they were literally refugees living in tents in a refugee camp on the charity of the government and churches. Uh, so they're not unlike refugees we are overwhelmed with today. 
and eventually they were able to get on ships and, and get themselves over to uh, the colonies. In the valley, the earliest German-speaking settlers did not start arriving until 1726. They're a little bit ahead of Governor Gooch and the big push to sell land. Adam Miller was in Page County in the Lower Valley, Yost Height in Frederick County. Uh, Jacob Stover was another developer type. Um, he got 10,000 acres in Rockingham County and had to find families to settle it. And then the first known German in uh, Rockbridge County, you probably are familiar with John Peter Sallum, who had a place down near Glasgow on the river. Germans were great potters, and one of their contributions uh, to crafts in the valley was pottery making. Uh, the Scotch-Irish did very little of that, and the English didn't do much either. Uh, Germans were also excellent gunsmiths. The Germans kept pretty much to themselves, and they were quite intent on keeping their language, and did until really the early eight, early 1800s. Uh, here is a children's book that was published in Newmarket by the Henkel Press in 1817, and you can see the bilingual nature of it. Uh, so they're still, still working on the language, still preaching it in many of their churches. Now, the third group are the people with no name, the Scotch-Irish. And we'll just have a little word about terminology because I always get raked over the coals about this and I call them Scotch Irish. Somebody says, Scotch is a beverage. <laughs> well, they called themselves when they came here mainly Irish. They lived in Ireland, the north of Ireland. They came from Ireland, they must be Irish, okay? Some people called them Ulster Scots because the part of Ireland they came from was Ulster. This is what it looked like when their grandparents settled it in the 1600s. Um, 100 years later, when they're leaving there, it was one of the four provinces in Ireland. It has nine counties. It is not the same thing as Northern Ireland today. Uh, that political unit that's part of Great Britain has six of these counties. Uh, it does not have Monaghan, Cavan, and Donegal because they are so heavily Catholic that the British didn't want them because they might give a Catholic majority of them. So Northern Ireland had six of the counties that had dominant uh, Protestant population. Uh, but these people came from Ulster, and a lot of the ones who came to Rockbridge County actually came from County Donegal, one of the ones that's not in Northern Ireland. Okay, so why did prosperous Presbyterians leave Ireland? Uh, they were largely prosperous because the Ulster Ulster linen industry. Uh, I think Huguenots had actually introduced this to Ireland, but it had become a major source of income. So a great many of the Scotch-Irish, unlike those desperately poor Germans who were in a refugee camp, a great many of the Scotch-Irish are able to sell the lease on their farm at a profit and buy their passage to the New World and buy land when they got here. So they're in much better shape. So why did they really want to leave Ireland if they were doing so well? Well, they'd had some bad weather and bad harvests like the Germans, but they're much more upset about other things. Um, English laws discriminating against their textiles would hurt their pocketbook. Uh, People in Ireland don't own their land, they are tenants. Generally, they had long-term leases for 30 years, 90 years, three lives, um, and they were very favorable because the rent never changes in that time. Well, those who got 30-year leases 
when a lot more Protestants rushed into Ulster in the 1690s. The leases had expired, and the landlords took that opportunity to raise the rent drastically. So another hit in the pocketbook. Then they were very upset that the English had passed a law that limited their civil rights, their political uh, participation. And they always resisted the fact that they had to pay tithes to the established Church of Ireland, which was the Anglican Church. So they had reasons to want to look elsewhere and did. The early settlers who came in the valley, well, there was a community along the Opecken Creek in Frederick County, south of Winchester. Uh, John Lewis is thought of as the first settler in the uh, Beverly tract up in the Stanton area, and here in Rockbridge, it's Ephraim McDowell with his sons, John and James. Okay, there were African Americans in the valley. We often, I think, forget that, but as a matter of fact, there were. Um, they, the Scotch-Irish and English were both interested in acquiring some slave labor when they had the opportunity. And beginning in the 1740s, they do. Uh, there are occasional free blacks. There's a fascinating book on your book list there about uh, Ned Tarr, the free black blacksmith, um, Turk McCluskey wrote. Um, so the numbers increase in the valley right up to the 1850s. And I think you'll be horrified to know that in counties like Augusta and Rockbridge, from 20 to 25 percent of the population was enslaved by 1850. So uh, that one of the early crops that they used slave labor on was um, hemp, which was a big money-making crop. They were growing wheat, they were growing a lot of grains, corn, hemp, flax. All of these were being exported from the valley. Cattle too. Uh, they were still finding furs and they were, there were merchants active up and down the valley. It, they have a very sophisticated economy uh, by the 1750s even. So you don't you just mustn't think of them as a bunch of frontier settlers. That only was true for a few years. We know they spent a lot of time developing their whiskey industry and shipping the stuff out. Milling was an important economic activity. Here's a mill uh, up in uh, uh, Frederick County. And cattle raising was also being in the valley. The Irish had always been big producers of cattle, so that came easily to them. Um, so most farms in the valley had cattle, and they are raising enough excess cattle that large cattle drives start as early as the 1740s. They will drive them to market down the valley to Winchester, and often all the way to Philadelphia, where there was a big market for them. There's a hiatus in the expansion of the valley in the years of the Seven Years' War. It's named when it's a global war, which it is. And again, the valley is an area that is a pawn in this great fight over empire. We call it the French and Indian War in North America, but it is part of the bigger Seven Years' War. And it was one that definitely affected uh, frontier settlements, especially um, here in Augusta County. Now, this is bigger Augusta County, so it's not just uh, Augusta and Rockbridge, but a much wider area. But uh, the statistics are kind of scary, 140 individuals were killed, uh, 172 <coughs> captured and carried off to Indian villages. Many of them never came back. Um, some of them preferred to stay with the Indians than to return to their families. 
um, and then a, a fair number of women. So uh, it, it was a, and of course, right here, just a couple of miles down the road was the massacre at Carr's Creek, uh, where 12 settlers were killed. Okay, another patchwork was in the religious denominations in the valley. We'll tackle the English first. We've got the established church. Uh, every time Virginia created a new county, it had to create a new parish for the established church. And that was the official church. Everybody in the county was expected to attend it at least once in a month. Uh, partly because that's where important government notices were passed out. Uh, the vestry got elected by the local people and they picked the minister. There were so few English when they had to elect the first vestry for Augusta County that 11 of the 12 members were Presbyterians. <laughs> the vestry levied the tithe which was the tax that everybody had to pay to support the church. The vestry also, however, all that money did not go to the minister. The vestry was the social service agency for the whole county. And so they took care of the poor widows. They took care of the elderly with no family. They took care of orphans. They took care of bastards. And they processioned the land to walk the boundaries and be sure that there were no disputes that would end up in court. So a lot of the tax money went to that. Okay, the Friends, uh, as I said earlier, were the first English group of settlers to come in here. Um, and I think you all know something of the background of the denomination, uh, that it, it was considered very radical by the established church, which it uh, criticized relentlessly and noisily sometimes. Um, they had made enormous international missionary efforts all over Europe and in America. George Fox even came to uh, America. And Penn, of course, took an enormous role in bringing Quakers uh, to his own colony and allowing religious toleration there. In fact, not only toleration, complete freedom of religion, but they're often pictured early on, in England at least, in sort of a cartoon fashion. The first meeting house that they built in the valley was Hopewell Meeting which is up in Frederick County near Clearbrook, a stunning uh, stone building that they, they replaced their original log building. Uh, it burned and then they uh, rebuilt it. Um, so that dates from the mid 18th century and is still functioning. Quakers were, women at least, were wonderful quilters and I ran across a book here that had beautiful Quaker quilts in it, so I thought I'd share one with you. Okay, Presbyterians. John Knox, as I trust you know, is the man who brought Calvinism to Scotland, and it took root there and became their version of Christianity. Um, important event when they gathered and signed a national covenant, I think they signed it in blood, protesting bishops and the prayer book. Uh, they wanted nothing of that aspect of Anglicanism. And so the Presbyterian Church, with its Calvinist theology, becomes the established church in Scotland. Uh, Presbyterians began coming to the middle colonies. They were tolerated uh, in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and Delaware, so lots of them there and they begin to filter down into the Shenandoah Valley as soon as the land becomes available. Now the problem with coming to Virginia is that they are leaving a place where they have religious freedom to come down and put themselves under the Anglican Church again. And that is a concern, but they also want to get their hands on some of the good land down here. So they sent a delegate down to talk to the governor and get him to guarantee that they would be tolerated, that he would apply the English Act of Toleration. 
so that if they registered their meeting houses and their minister's name and held their meetings on Sunday and didn't do a bunch of ranting around in the fields and preaching in the middle of the week, then they would be tolerant. And so starting in 1739, ministers began to come to the valley and work to organize these scattered groups of Presbyterians that had been meeting in houses for prayer meetings. So they get them put in church order, uh, they build log meeting houses initially, uh, they call a minister if they're able to get one, they're in short supply, and then eventually build a stone church, and the stone churches look pretty much like these two examples. The one there on the top is Augusta Stone Church, which is still standing, although much expanded, uh, in Fort Defiance, north of Stanton. And I'm not remembering which one this is. It could be Old Providence. Um, but at any rate, those are very typical and very Irish looking, that meeting houses in Ireland looked like that, and that's where they came from. Okay, now. Germans come in many more flavors than Scotch-Irish. <laughs> Scotch-Irish are plain vanilla, one flavor. Germans come as Lutherans, uh, the followers of the man who started the whole Reformation, uh, Martin Luther. There is his handwritten translation of the Bible into German. He sort of created the... the uh, proper high German language with that, uh, wrote it up there in that castle in the Wartburg. Another <coughs> strand of the Reformed Church, or of, of Reformation, is the Reformed Church, or churches, that came out of Geneva, Switzerland, where John Calvin, like Luther, originally a uh, Catholic priest, uh, he had developed his own theology, very Christian Catholicism, and out of his work you get the German Reformed, the Dutch Reformed, the Presbyterian Church, and the New England Congregationalists. German Reformed congregations in this country had a horrible time getting ministers. Uh, they're in very short supply, and most of them are happily settled in Pennsylvania, don't really want to come down to the frontier. Uh, here's a plea that was issued by one congregation and sent over to Germany, trying to uh, beg some to come over from there. They failed. Uh, the Germans had a kind of interesting arrangement, very different from uh, England, where there was one established church, the Church of England. Uh, in the peace treaty that had ended one of their several wars over religion, they came up with this formula that whoever is the ruler gets to pick the church. So if he's a Lutheran, all of his people are Lutherans. If he's a Catholic, all of his people are Catholic. And then after an amendment, uh, after the Thirty Years' War, if he's reformed, his people are reformed. However, what you could not be in Germany was something like an Anabaptist. Uh, they were pretty heavily uh, persecuted, not just discriminated against. And here, of course, uh, you see in one of their books uh, uh, the worst possible things happening to them. But some of these were, were quite true. Uh, they spent a lot of time in jail, and plenty of them were uh, tortured and uh, hanged. Uh, one variety of the Anabaptists were the Mennonites. Uh, they developed from the preaching of another Catholic priest who uh, turned off his back on the church, but also turned his back on varieties such as uh, Luther's. Uh, and this was Menno Simon, who came from Friesen in Germany. Uh, and developed a group of followers that became uh, the Mennonite Church. Uh, a radical rejection of uh, most of what was typical in either Catholicism or Lutheranism. Uh, they 
practice adult baptism. Uh, they live in rather tight-knit communities, uh, very dependent on getting back to the early church of the New Testament. Um, Mennonites started coming to America as soon as Pennsylvania opened up in 1682. By the 1730s, when the valley is opening up to settlement, they begin coming down here. And um, they eventually develop a variety of types. The Amish are an offshoot of the Mennonites that developed in the 1690s. They were ultra conservative. They found the Mennonites far too liberal. <laughs> Now, in Virginia, in modern times, you have Old Order Mennonites who you could easily mistake for Amish because they are driving buggies, they are wearing the black clothes, they are not educating their children beyond the eighth grade, and all of those things. Um, you also have a group of Mennonites called the Beachy Amish, uh, they're a 20th century development. Uh, you have Southeastern Conference, which is, I, I can't tell you what its difference is, if you want to know the truth. And then you have a lot of the people who are Mennonites in the valley today, you wouldn't know they're Mennonites to meet them. They look just like you do, they dress just like you do. Uh, they are running a splendid university up in Harrisonburg. They have a fabulous retirement center that is much bigger than Kendall. Um, so they run the, the whole range from, from ultra-conservative to very modern. The other Anabaptist-type German congregation were the German Baptist Brethren. They became known as the Dunkers or Tunkers. Um, today their name is the Church of the Brethren. But the picture here shows you why they were called dunkers. They go down to the river and push you under, and you come up a new person. Uh, this church was founded by a man named Alexander Mack, uh, who lived in the, in the village of Shreesheim, a little north of Heidelberg. Um, he developed these ideas and had followers, and they took refuge uh, in Wittgenstein, and, uh, one of the many, many little uh, duchy-type governments uh, where they were welcomed. And there, they came up with this idea of rebaptizing in the river. A uh, couple of their groups were among the early immigrants to Pennsylvania in 1719 and 1729, and they start showing up in Virginia as early as 1735, the Funk family, uh, who are still up in the Strasburg area. Um, a group of them went far beyond uh, Lexington. They went all the way down to the New River in the Radford area. Um, in 1745, uh, they were kind of close, they were slightly weird group connected with the Ephraim a bunch. Um, and then the Glick family, there's still lots of Glicks around in the Mount Jackson area. Uh, many others just trickle in gradually, but they tend to be the latest comers uh, before the revolution as far as various uh, ethnic groups go, and um, they worship primarily in houses. It's not until after 1800 that they even build churches. Uh, they continue wearing the old-fashioned dress, a little bit like the Mennonites, up until about 1900, but since then they have modernized uh, completely like modern uh, Mennonites. Uh, both of these denominations are pacifists, um, and they are people, both of them, who do an enormous amount of good works in tough situations. They are first responders in floods and hurricanes and tornadoes. Their outreach uh, to people that way is, is quite exceptional. 
So now that's kind of the end of the groups. Um, so how about these people? I didn't say a word about any of them, did I? <laughs> well, maybe I mentioned the Amish. Okay, the reason I didn't is that they weren't here. If they'd been here, you'd have been here stuck another 15 minutes hearing about them. <laughs> Um, Shakers are very late comers. That denomination develops in the 19th century, mainly in New England, New York, um, Midwest. The Moravians are early comers and they're great missionaries and great settlers. Uh, they were all over Pennsylvania uh, from their base in uh, Bethlehem and the Lidditz area. And then you are going to have a chance to hear a lot about them very soon when Catherine Knapp, Johnny's daughter, uh, is here talking about a Moravian um, group of women who made quite a pilgrimage. Um, so you'll get a lot of them then. The Amish, again, um, they weren't here. The, the, the uh, Mennonites, the Old Order Mennonites were here, but the Amish did not settle in uh, Virginia at all in the 18th century. There are Amish here now, but they are our recent uh, newcomers by and far. So, okay, now if your head is an aching terribly and you're not too eager to get through the line, you can do one or two questions. Anybody's got one? When you commented about the, the great uh, wagon road and it being a heavily trafficked, is that three wagons a day, 17 wagons a day? Um, I don't know. I don't have a number, Tana, which I did. Um, I guess it looked heavy to them. It probably would not to us. But they, you know, if you think about all those distillers who were shipping their whiskey out and every farmer is wanting to ship out his rain or ship the flour that he's made. And you know those millers, one of the ways they got well off is that they they took a percentage of the grain that they ground. That's how you paid the miller. It was not in money, but by part of, well, if he grinds for a whole lot of farmers, he's got a whole lot of flour, a lot more than his wife can make in the bread. And so he's shipping that extra flour up to Philadelphia and making even more money. Um, so I, I don't know. I wish I could tell you. Livestock and turkeys. Oh, yeah, yeah. not only do they buy cattle, they buy turkeys to market. <laughs> <laughs> there are wonderful descriptions of when the turkeys can. Can you imagine how that herding cats? Can you imagine herding turkeys? <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, did Lord Fairfax ever visit his holdings, land holdings, in the New World? Not only did he visit them, he moved over here, lock, stock, and barrel. He had a place called Greenway Court up in what's now Clark County, near the town of village of White Post. Right. And it, he entertained lavishly there. He did a lot of hunting parties uh, and was very interested in his land. He lived until after the revolution. He died shortly after. And so here he is, this, this British aristocrat living in the middle of Virginia, which is, is rapidly uh, patriot. Uh, they just ignored him. He was well liked locally. <laughs> And so they, he's an old guy, we'll just let him live out his life at Greenway Court. The house no longer exists, uh, but his land office there, which is just a pretty little stone building, is still there. Yeah? What is the Roanoke Gap versus the Cumberland Gap? I don't know about the Roanoke Gap. The it was one of your oh, horrors. <laughs> <laughs> You can look it up and let me know when you find out. <laughs> but I know that lots of the gaps up, you know, down the, the Blue Ridge, not so much the Alleghenies. Um, Madison, you ever hear of it? Roman Gap? You find out and inform us. <laughs> okay, gang, it's time for 